Good morning. Go ahead, greet 20,000 people. It's getting bigger and bigger. There are so many new faces here, please. Okay. And uh, text your friends before we begin that we are going live. Again, I would like to address those in the U.S. Thank you for joining us. And also down in Australia, Sister Jenny and the rest of the family, thank you. And over here, Sister Joam, thank you very much. Those in Dubai, in Malaysia, you're watching. God bless you all, and may you all enjoy the Word of God. Okay, so uh, I'm going to talk about our wilderness. For those who have been reading the book of Psalms, Psalm 78, it's a narrative, it's a story of the life of God's people, the Jews. And most of you are familiar with this since childhood, that after 400 years, finally God set them free. So they need to travel and then cross the Red Sea towards the Promised Land. Egypt to the Promised Land. But the problem is this, before you get to the Promised Land, you have to cross the desert. You have to cross the wilderness. And as you read Psalm 78, it's actually everything is here. The whole story is here. How God has blessed them, and they saw the power of God in their midst, from the plagues to the opening of the Red Sea. However, somewhere in verse 17 to 20, let me read. But they sinned even more against him by rebelling against the Most High in the wilderness. And they tested God in their hearts by asking for the food of their fancy. Yes, they spoke against God. They said, can God prepare a table in the wilderness? In other words, what they were saying, enough of the quail, enough of the manna, we need more. We need salad. We need lechon. We need lamb stew. We need all of this. We need the onions and the garlics. And, and it was a life continuously complaining and grumbling and complaining against the Lord. So the question is, can God set a table in the wilderness? Make it more personal to you. You have your own wilderness. We are going to talk about that. Can God also set a table in the wilderness? Psalm 78, they spoke against God, saying, Can God spread a table in the wilderness? For many of you who are traveling, I know that you have been to the Holy Land, and you have you know, probably experienced traveling through the desert. The closest I got was when we went to Australia, and they brought us to the desert. It was not a nice place. It was a very fearful place. It's not a place that I want to live. I don't know with you. And I would like to describe the desert as nothing. Say with me, nothing. There's really nothing there. You can go miles and miles and miles from the north, South, west, east, there is really nothing there. It's a dry land. So I would say nothing. And in the case of God's people, they were in the wilderness. And they keep on complaining and complaining and complaining. And it was not the first time. It was something that they would continually do. They would question God. They would question even Moses. Who are you? You know, let's change the leadership. And so for many of us, we also have our own wilderness, and it's not a nice place to be. In some ways, the doubts that they had, we can understand. Because in the wilderness, it's a very, very fearful moment. It's a very tense moment. You are leaving whatever is familiar and moving towards what is unfamiliar. One writer would even express it this way. It's not so much that we are afraid of change. 
or so in love with old ways. But it's that place in between we fear. It's like being in between trapezes. There's nothing to hold on to. Of course, you have seen all of this in the circus. You know, this trapeze man. And he wants to move to the other stick. And he's all holding to this stick over here. And so for him to go to the other stick, he has to let go of, of this stick. And he said that in between is the most fearful time. What if the other stick does not come? What if the other stick does not arrive on time? And so you're in between space. And you have already made a decision to let go. And you have to trust the other guy that he will let go of the stick so you can hold on to that. And so the author said, that's like being in the wilderness. It would have been easier if they left Egypt and immediately crossing the Red Sea. And right after that, that would be the promised land. However, however, that is not how God works. You know why? The wilderness is solitary. The wilderness is a lonely place. But by definition, the wilderness is a lonely place. But we all have to go through our own desert time. So when you read the story of the Jews, it makes sense, of course, for them to leave Egypt. Can you imagine 400 years of slavery? You don't want to be a slave, but for us, it's a beautiful picture of the old life and the new life. For them, it was Egypt. For us, it was our spiritual Egypt. It was a life before we met Christ. It was a life without Christ. And then we opened our lives to the Lord. We got a new life. Now, Jesus is in us. Now, we have the new life. Now, we are going to the promised land. And so the same thing happened to them. When they left Egypt, of course, they were very happy. Who would not? After 400 years of being a slave, we were also enslaved to our sin. We were in bondage to our sin. And all of a sudden, there's a new life over here. And then they found out something. They found out that there is a life called the desert life. It's a lonely place. It was a tough place to live. It's a frightening place. However, we have to learn something. For us to go to the promised land, we have first to leave our own Egypt. But after leaving our own Egypt, before going to the promised land, we have to pass through the desert time. We have our own wilderness, by the way. Therefore, in that wilderness, it is very, very easy to doubt God. In that wilderness, it is very easy to, do, to do doubt God that he doesn't know what he's doing. He doesn't know what is happening to us. Of course, he does. All of a sudden, in the desert time, we feel so abandoned, forgotten, Again, that's the reason why we need you to belong to a small group. Because all of us, whether you like it or not, we are all going to go through our desert time. So you need people to encourage you. You need people to support you. And it comes in many shapes. It comes in many ways. I remember 40 years ago, I guess, I wanted to apply for my first job. So I sent letters of application. And in between, it was a frightening experience. Will they accept me or not? Will they accept me? And for me, that was my desert time. It was a tense moment for me. For some of you today, you're hoping and hoping for a good news from the doctor. And you are waiting the good news. 
For some people, the desert time would be watching that your money is slowly depleting and the business is not good. This could be your wilderness time. For some, they're worrying about their children. They're not with you. Something happened to them. There's nothing you can do. So it will be a wilderness time. For some people, you don't know if you are still going to last for another week. You don't have a job. You don't have money. You don't know what to do. That is a wilderness time. For some people, you want to forgive. But you just find it hard to forgive. That could be your wilderness. For some, it could be a broken relationship that you wanted to patch up a long time ago. And you cannot find the right time. And you are waiting and waiting and waiting. And it could be anything, by the way. It could be anything. And so in those tense moments, in those fearful moments, again, it is very to think, easy to think that God has forgotten me. Ever happened to you? God, where are you? Now, it's the other way around. In our own wilderness, we are the ones who have forgotten God. It's not that God has forgotten us. We are the ones who have forgotten God. Amen? Is that true? Let's move on. The wilderness is very, very necessary. In verse 19, they said, Can God set a table in the wilderness? What's a table? Well, we all have tables in the homes. Last December... Our tables were full of food. The family was there. The fellowship was there. The laughter was there. You know, we share our life together in the table of the family. We had these great reunions happening to us. And so we need this kind of table because you are there as a family. There's something there. There's food and fellowship and laughter. And then when you come together in a table, what happens? You begin to understand each other. You begin to listen to one another. You begin to discover that they also have problems like yours. And you begin to understand each other. David said, you prepare a table for me in the presence of my enemies. Even in the midst of problems, God can provide something for you. Not only the the provision that we need for physical needs, even the spiritual need and the emotional need. God can do that in the table. And then you come to the New Testament, and we are being invited once a month here. We can also do it even weekly if we want to partake in the Lord's table. Why? What happens when we come to the Lord's table? We come together as brothers and sisters. We come together as a community. We take all our labels, the status, our race. Nobody here becomes a reverend. Nobody here becomes a pastor. We take away all the titles. We come into the table of grace and participate. Why? So that we can remember what he has done. So that we can remember the goodness of the Lord. We can remember his grace and come together now and give thanks to God. You see, the problem with the Jewish people, they keep on forgetting and forgetting and forgetting. And so when you read this account, sometimes you cannot help but to say in Olongo, na naman is la tao man. After all what God has given them, they still complain, they still grumble. Non-stop. So I find myself saying that, but you know very clear, the Lord is saying, hindi lang sila ikaw man. I don't know if that is true for you. Can you hear God saying that? You know, we, we blame them, we accuse them. What kind of people are you? After all what God has done for you, you keep on complaining and you even say, can you set a lechon in the wilderness for me? Can you provide this for me? After all what God has shown you, and very clear, God is also saying, you are also doing 
the same thing. Yes, therefore it is very necessary to understand this. Even Jesus himself promised his disciples that someday they will eat and drink at my table in my kingdom. In Luke chapter 14, verse 21, talks about the salvation of life. You know, God offers salvation to everyone. And so what he did, he told his disciples, uh, his servants rather, you go out quickly into the streets and the alleys of the town and bring in the poor and crippled, the blind and the lame. Why? Because the people that they invited did not come. The people who were offered salvation did not come and so he said why don't you go to the outcast of society and give it to them and so they came but that was not enough he said go out again to the roads and the country lanes and compel them to come in so that my house is going to be full look chapter 22 they would eat and drink at my table in my kingdom revelations 19 there is going to be a wedding supper of the lamb in the future in other words, we can see here that as we accuse them of being ungrateful, it's also wise to look at ourselves in the mirror because we also do the same. How quickly we take our blessings for granted. Let's go back to them. The Lord led them out of Egypt. They saw the power of God, the ten plagues, and then they moved out. And then the Red Sea was divided. That's powerful. Have you ever seen Gimaras being divided? I mean, what would happen tomorrow if you go to Bredco and all of a sudden it would divide? Will you shout, Alleluia? And you shout, Thank you, Lord? And then you go to Gimaras. And in the afternoon you come back again. You know, you would thank God. What if the next day you have a problem? And then you just easily forget what God has done. And this is exactly what happened to them. He delivered, he delivered them from the Pharaoh's power. He set them free from bondage, the same thing for us. He protected them from the plagues. He led them into, with a cloud during the day and a pillar of fire by night. They gave, I mean, the Lord gave them water from the rocks. But you know what happened? After all of this, all of this, bottom line, not enough. It's not enough. Lord, it's not enough. I want more, I want more, I want more. Why do you think these things happen to us? The moment we don't trust God, these things will happen to us. The moment we don't trust the Lord, then we see ourselves asking the same question. God, can you set a table in the wilderness? As if God cannot do anything as if God cannot serve you, as if we are serving a very poor God who cannot provide for you. And you know the whole story. God gave them manna. God gave them the quail. Do you think they started to trust in the Lord? No, they did not. They continued to doubt the Lord. Again, we are just like them. We are just like them. I don't know with you. I am just like them. What about you? The same thing? Ako lang di isa? Sorry, ah. This is the kind of pastor you have. Ungrateful man sometimes. This is me. I keep on forgetting. You know, all the blessing that God has done, sometimes I would find myself saying, Lord, can you set a table in my own wilderness? When we find ourselves doing this, we have no idea how much food, I mean, not just the physical food, but the spiritual food, that God has prepared for us. Amen? Really, as if we are serving a very poor God, as if God cannot give this to us. But one thing that I have discovered after 40 years with the Lord, in my own wilderness, I find my own weaknesses too. It is in my wilderness that I will find how weak I am. And it is in my wilderness that I saw the power of God in my life. So, if you want to experience the power of God, if you want to eat manna and quail 
what are we going to do? You have to leave Egypt, go through the wilderness, and to the promised land. There is no such thing as a shortcut in the wilderness of God. Amen? Do you want to go through a shortcut? That will not happen. Number three, the wilderness is very, very temporary. For some people, it might be longer. For some people, maybe shorter. However, it's not, again, an easy place. It's a very dangerous place. There is nothing there, really, in the wilderness. Nothing. I would always describe my own desert as nothing. It's so easy to get lost there. Even, you know, if you're surrounded by people, as we were driving through the desert, there were several of us in the car, but you still have that lonely feeling. It's not really a nice place to be with. However, in our own desert time, it is also the place where you, for example, learn your own limitations. Sometimes we think we are really Superman. Sometimes we think that we cannot get sick. We will get sick. Sometimes we think that we will never fail in our businesses. Oh, you will fail. You will fail. In the wilderness, you are going to face your own failures. Like I said, I have failed a million times. What about you? Have you failed a million times? Ako malangya, kunding million times. Okay, sige lang. In my wilderness, oh, that's a place where I wrestle with temptation. The roaring lion is always there. The devil is always there to tempt us. But you know something? In my wilderness, God's voice is very loud. It is when God prospers us that we can't hear much the voice of the Lord. But in the wilderness, it's only you and God because it's a lonely place. It's a quiet place. But in the wilderness, you can hear clearly the word of God. Amen? In your own wilderness, you are going to encounter the impossible. What you thought would be impossible becomes possible because God is powerful. And for those who have journeyed with us here in Ictus, we have seen so many things what used to be impossible, but God made it possible. Amen? And to God be the glory. And the reason is because we continue to put our faith in Him. After all, we also have our own 40 years. Why not continue to trust the Lord? I know sometimes you criticize me for having that kind of faith. I understand that. Why not? Why should I not trust my God who has provided for us here for 40 years? Why not? I can't blame you. But I know you're also going through your wilderness. And in our wilderness, we learn what God is really like. How loving, how powerful, how caring He is. That's wilderness. Let's make it more personal. Where is your wilderness today? We all have. Could it be somebody you don't like? I hope he's not sitting next to you. <laughs> That's your wilderness. Somebody that you have been living with for a long time now, and you don't somehow... You're, you don't like it. Keep on praying. God is doing something in your life. For some, it could be a difficult situation in your workplace. You're having a problem with your job now. You are having a problem with your business. Business is not good. That could be your wilderness. For some people, you're still learning to deal with grief. Somebody close to you, somebody that you love just died, and you're still feeling the pain. For some, maybe you lost your job. For some, it's just simply your boring life. There's nothing going on in your life. Maybe for some, it's really cancer 
that is growing inside you, or a father who has abandoned you, or a sick child that you have in the hospital right now. It could be anything. It could be a marriage slowly dying now. Maybe it's the family you would rather not see and be with at all. It could be anything, ang wilderness naton. And so I throw back the question to all of us. Can God provide a table in your wilderness? Again, can God provide a table in your personal wilderness? Yes, yes He can, because that's His job. He meets us exactly when we feel abandoned. He provides us exactly when we needed something. That is why God is saying, I will spread a table for you in your own wilderness today. Let me quote John Piper. Oh, how God must become weary with how often we question his itinerary for our lives. You know, when you travel, your, your uh, travel agency would give you a, your IT, and when you like it, that's good. But in the case, John Piper said, not with God. You know why? How often we think we know better how to get from here to there. We are so much more prone to what? To grumble with a conductor when the train turns south than we are to sit patiently and wait for lessons from the Lord. He is a very mysterious guide. We never quite know what is coming next. God would never make it in the travel industry because he is always leading the best clients into the wilderness. So you don't want to get him as your travel agent. The first thing he will do, where do we go? Straight to the wilderness. Ah, ikaw lang. He even led his own son into the wilderness 40 days. So it's clearly not because he has something against people that he leads them into the wilderness. He must think there is something good to be gotten out of it. He must think there is no hurry to glut oneself on milk and honey. Sometimes we are so in a hurry to go to the promised land to drink all of that milk and honey, but we don't want to go into the wilderness. But there's so much to learn in our wilderness. You see, by definition, you have to be in the Wilderness, what? First, then and only then can God set a table for you. So you want God to set a table for you? You have to leave your Egypt first and go into your wilderness so that you can experience manna, so that you can experience the quail. Can you imagine even God himself led Jesus into the wilderness. And so he was tempted there. And God provided, empowered him through the power of the Holy Spirit to overcome the temptation. Jesus needed that. And the same thing for us. We know that the wilderness is never, never easy. But God has purposes for us in the wilderness that can never, I would say, can never be accomplished by staying where? In Egypt. You want God to prepare for you in the wilderness, in your own wilderness? You have to leave Egypt. Therefore, for us here at Ictus, those who resolve to follow Jesus, let me say this, must eventually spend time in the desert with him. Amen? Do you like that? Because in that lonely place, you can gain what cannot be gained in Egypt. You can gain what cannot be bought except through pain and suffering. It was necessary for Jesus to be in the wilderness. It is necessary for us to be in the wilderness. I know it's not a fun place to be. I said that. You will always find yourself like giving up someday. 
Lord, this is too much. This is too much. But do not despair. Stand your ground. Cling on the promises of God. Do not turn back to the old ways of life. Don't give in to your emotions. Lean on your brothers and sisters in Christ. You know why? God never, sorry, leads us into the wilderness in order to destroy us. No. He intends the time of testing to make us even stronger and stronger in the wilderness. Amen? So we should even have that perspective of saying, thank you, Lord, for the wilderness. When was the last time you said, thank you, Lord, for your wilderness? I want you to think about this. In the wilderness, there is victory there. In the wilderness, there is spiritual growth. In the wilderness, the Holy Spirit is there. You can see the power of God there. And of course, in the wilderness, Jesus is there. Number three. And number four. The wilderness is a boot camp. It's a training camp. You can always see this balikatan. That the soldiers would always train and train and train. Why? They need to prepare just in case there's going to be war. Now let's go to the case of Moses. Before they crossed the promised land, all right? He gathered all the people and talks to them. And you know what he said? It's a warning that the most dangerous place for the heart of man is not the wilderness. The most dangerous place for the heart of man is the prosperity of the promised land. You got it? That the only way that we can shield ourselves from pride and self-sufficiency is to have a continuous recollection of what God has done and how God has trained us in the wilderness of our lives. Let's go to Deuteronomy chapter 8. I'm reading from 1 to 5 first. It's not in your notes. Keep and live out the entire commandment just before crossing the Red Sea, that I'm commanding you today so that you will live and prosper and enter and own the land that God promised to your ancestors. Remember every road that God led you on those 40 years in the wilderness, pushing you to your limits, testing you so that he would know what you were made of. Whether you would keep his commandments or not, he put you through hard times, he made you go hungry. Then he fed you with manna, something neither you nor your parents knew anything about. So you would learn that men and women don't live by bread alone. We live by every word that comes forth from the mouth of God. Your clothes did not wear out. Your feet did not blister those 40 years. You learned deep in your heart that God disciplines you. In the same way a father disciplines his child. So it's paramount that you keep the commandments of God, your God. Walk down the roads he shows you and reverently respect him. God is about to bring you into a good land. A land with brooks and rivers, springs and lakes. They never had it in the wilderness. Streams out of the hills and through the valleys. It's a land of wheat and barley, of vines and figs and pomegranates, of olives, oil and honey. It's a land where you will never go hungry. Always food on the table and a roof over your head. It's a land where you'll get iron out of rocks and mine copper from the hills. Fantastic. After a meal, satisfied, bless God, your God, for the good land he has given you. Make sure you don't forget God, your God, by not keeping his commandments, his rules and regulations that I command you today. Make sure that when you eat and are satisfied, okay, 
when you build pleasant houses and settle in, see your herds and flocks flourish and more and more money come in, watch your standard of living going up and up, make sure you don't become so full of yourself and your things that you forget God, your God. The God who delivered you from the Egyptian slavery. The God who led you through the huge and fearsome wilderness. Those desolate, arid badlands crawling with fiery snakes and scorpions. The God who gave you water gushing from hard rock. The God who gave you manna to eat in the wilderness. Something your ancestors had never heard of. In order, watch this, to give you a taste of the hard life. Then, he says, to test you. So that you would be, that's the key word, be prepared to live well in the days ahead of you. If you start thinking to yourself, I did all this and all by myself, I'm rich, it's all mine, well, think again. Remember that God, your God, gave you the strength to produce all this wealth so as to confirm the covenant that he promised to your ancestors as it is today. If you forget, forget God, your God, and start taking up with other gods, serving and worshiping them, I'm on record right now as giving you a firm warning that will be the end of you. I mean it, destruction. You'll go to your doom, the same as the nation God is destroying before you. Doom, because you wouldn't obey the voice of God, your God. Can we simplify this? Three things in the wilderness. One is really to humble them. And the same thing for us. Number two is really to test them. Test them. If they are now prepared for the good life, the promised land. And number three, to do good to them in the end. Wait, wait, wait. Maybe you ask me, what do you mean good? You know, the good, we have now houses and businesses, the gold and the silver and the wealth, and all of these good things is now going to be ours. Is that the good? No. You don't need 40 years in the wilderness to know how to get wealth. You don't need 40 years. You know what the good is? The good that God aimed to do to us through the wilderness is this. That you and I and the people of God will come to a point of intense and deeply and lastingly consciousness of our total dependence on God for everything. Remember the wilderness? The key word is? Say with me, nothing. In the wilderness, remember, it was nothing. It was just you and God. It was just nothing and God. Now that the Lord has blessed you in the promised land, it is no longer nothing. It is something. But the most painful truth is this. The more that God will bless us, the lesser we begin to trust in Him. Hello? You won't believe that? The more that God is going to bless us in the promised land, according to Moses, be prepared. Look at your heart. The more God will bless you, the lesser you trust in him. What's the example here? When you had nothing, it was so easy to give to the Lord. Amen. When you had everything, you find all reasons not to give to the Lord. You find ways not to give to the Lord. When you had nothing, you can give you 10%. When God gave you everything, no, 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 no. I have all kinds of reason not to give the same amount. The more God will bless, the lesser our tendency is to even trust Him. Hello? Hello? Therefore, the real testing ground is not the wilderness. The real testing ground is the promised land. Are you ready in the promised land? They describe the wilderness as full of scorpions and serpents. That may be true. 
there are more scorpions and serpents also in the promised land. Not in the form of animals and insects. No, in the form of wealth and gold and silver. And it's so hard to avoid them. And we are not immune to their sting and bites. And we cannot afford to ignore God's travel plan by passing through the wilderness. In other words, if you understand what Moses said, because God allowed the wilderness over here, we should even be more thankful that God has given us the wilderness. Amen? So that we can be prepared for the promised land. You see, if you are not prepared for the promised land over here, you will fail. It's almost like, I think it's Bill Gates, who is not going to turn over his kingdom in, for, to his children. Because he knows exactly it will only spoil them. He will only give them a portion, but they need to work. And the same thing with our children. You keep on giving them money and money and money without preparing them over here in the wilderness. All your money will just disappear anyway. The same thing for us. And so there's a reason for the wilderness. And we should be thankful for God because all the experiences in the wilderness will help us move to the promised land of God. Amen. Is it easy? No way. But it is good for us. And those who have been trained in the boot camp today in the promised land, you are the ones who are most happy. You are the ones who is most free. And you are the ones who is even more thankful because God allowed you to be in the wilderness. Amen. There is no shortcut. Remember this? They were about to go into the promised land. Two and a half years at the Mount of Sinai, just ready. So the spies were sent. Joseph and Caleb were there. They came back and they said, let us go up at once and occupy it, for we are well able to overcome it. The other ten said, no way. We are not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we they failed two and a half years of examination. And the Lord said, okay, two and a half years in the curriculum, let's make it 40 years. And so they went back. They turned around again. In Numbers 14, the Lord said, how long will these people despise me? And how long will they not believe in me in spite of all the signs which I have wrought among them? I will strike them with a pestilence and disinherit them. He got so mad. But Moses said, no, 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 Lord, don't do that. If you do that, the people in Egypt will not believe in you. And the Lord said, okay, okay. I have pardoned according to your word, but truly as I live and as the earth shall be filled with the glory of God, none of the men who have seen my glory and my signs which I wrote in Egypt and in the wilderness and yet have put me to the proof, how many times? Ten times. And have not hearkened to my voice, shall see the land which I swore to give to the fathers and none of those who despise me shall see it. Numbers 14, But my servant Caleb, because he has different spirit and has followed me fully, I will bring into the land in which he went, and his descendants shall possess it. Joseph, Joshua rather, and Caleb. Exodus 16, The whole company of Israel complained against Moses and Aaron there in the wilderness. The Israelites said, Why did God let us die in comfort in Egypt, where we had lambs too and all the bread we could eat? You have brought us out into this wilderness to starve us to death, the whole company of Israel. Wow. And more and more and more, I will just challenge you to read it. Why can't we have meat? We ate fish in Egypt and got it for free. To say nothing of the cucumbers and the melons and the leeks and the onions and the garlic. Nothing tastes good out here. All we get is, oh, mana, 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 mana. Can you find yourself doing the same thing? I do. We're all on the same boat. Never mind. My question for all of us is this. Can God provide a table in the wilderness? The answer is, yes. In fact, He did. He did. 
for stiff-necked and rebellious people. He provided for them in spite of what they have done. Will God again provide for you in your wilderness? The answer is yes. How much more for those who have believed in Him and trust in His saving power? And I know you do. You see, in the wilderness, you might find yourself again crying out to the Lord, Lord, where's the fancy food? Lord, where is this? Where is this? You know what? In the wilderness, the only one that you will find is Jesus himself. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his, and all of these things will be added unto you. If we find ourselves complaining and complaining and complaining, God is saying, seek me first. I have already provided myself to you. And if you have Jesus, you have everything that you need. Life on earth is not about us. Life on earth is all about the kingdom of God. That's why when we start to pray, the kingdom come. They will be done. One more. Will God provide a table in your wilderness? Yes, He can. He will. Because He has provided Himself. Everybody please read. Trust in the Lord and do good. So you will dwell in the land and enjoy security. Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust in him, and he will act. He will bring forth your vindication as the light, and your right as the noonday. Be still before the Lord, and wait patiently for him. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for the wilderness. This wilderness, sometimes we do just feel so lonely, dear God. It's painful. But thank you because we have to. Thank you because it is necessary for us to prepare us for the prosperity of the promised land the new life that you have given us, the victorious life, the abundant life. And Lord, for many, many times, we have not trusted even you enough. We do ask forgiveness, Lord. From now on, bless your people today. Bless them even more, dear God. Thank you for the training. Thank you for the equipping time in the wilderness. Thank you for all the lessons that we are learning so that we can even enjoy it more now in the promised land. And above all, Lord, thank you because you have given yourself to us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. God bless you. See you next time.